Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from the creativepen.com and today I'm here with Alastair Humphreys. Hi Al! Hello. <laughs> so just as a quick introduction, Al is an adventurer, an author of five books and a motivational speaker. His last book was There Are Other Rivers, about walking across southern India and the deeper side of travel addiction, which we're going to talk about today, as well as writing memoir. So it's going to be a fascinating talk. Um, so Al, just as a start, tell us a bit more about you and your adventuring life so far. What, 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 sort of potted biography? Yes. Potted, because I know it's been a long one. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, I um, after leaving university, I cycled around the world for four years, and then I wrote a book about that, and decided after that first book to try and make my living from adventure. So through writing about it, um, books, magazines, blogs, and through speaking about it, and I, in the last. Years since in the years since cycling around the world, I've um, walked across southern India, as you mentioned. I've done an expedition last year up in Greenland. I rode the Atlantic, um, and I most recently walked a thousand miles across the empty quarter, following the footsteps of one of my favourite books, *Arabian Sands* by a guy called Wilfred Thesiger. That's fantastic, and everyone's just going, "Oh my goodness me." <laughs> <laughs> Who is this guy anyway? <laughs> but as we're going to talk about today, this is, of course this is a podcast about writing, so we're going to be going to be talking about that. But um, recently I heard you speak at a an adventuring thing, and um, one of the things that I guess really impresses me about the way you live is that you actually take action on your dreams. But what you also said, which is quite funny, is you say you're not special person in any way you don't have any special skills I think it's the way you put it um, but most people struggle with this kind of taking action on their dreams so how do you get past inertia and all the things that stop us to do all these adventuring things as well as write books um, I think it's a very hard thing to do and I think it's the the biggest obstacle to making stuff happen but I also think it's probably what differentiates people who achieve stuff from people who don't achieve what they want to do much, much more than any talent side of uh, of the equation. So um, I try to, and I find it very hard to overcome inertia. I get lazy and I get worried about stuff just like everyone does. But I just try and force myself to begin because I think that came about through my adventures, really, realizing that the first step is is literally the most difficult one on the journeys and I get very nervous before I start but once you're off it's so much easier and and I think that transfers into everything that I that I do so whenever I try and do a new project now I just force myself to start it and um, worry about failing and making it good and things like that a bit later on down the line. Yes, yeah, so you mentioned there about taking the first step and that's the hardest. And how does that equate to writing books? Because a lot of people find, you know, getting started on that. And I guess actually with travel, like reading books about travel as opposed to doing it is probably the same as reading books about writing and not doing it. So how do you get the first steps done there with writing? Um, I, well, I usually faff around and procrastinate and waste a huge amount of time until I get so annoyed at myself that I then just force myself to sit down and start writing and and I never start um, with the beginning of a book I just sit down and write whatever bit I feel like doing and and actually the beginning of the book is usually what I do right at the end so I tend to start just by writing the bits that I feel like um, I suppose that writing travel is is easier in some ways than other types of writing because you're just recounting what's happened so um, I tend uh, certainly in the early stages not really to have much plan of the format of the book so I just sit down and write what happened and then um, I churn through that for thousands and thousands and thousands of words um, until someday when I can't be bothered to write anything then I then I do a bit of planning for the day and when I can't be bothered to do any planning or writing then I do editing which is really just sitting in a cafe with a red pen, um, imagining that I'm actually a serious writer, um, and the days when the days when I'm the most motivated, I just sit down and churn out words because I find that by far the hardest thing to do when I write books. Hmm. And what I 
we'll talk about editing now then because I think editing is one of those things that a lot of people struggle with but um, you recently did this trip across the empty quarter and I, I watched your film and it, it obviously becomes evident that while you're traveling there's a lot of repetitive repetitive movement a lot of boredom a lot of things that people don't want to hear about as in you can say like you know one time I did this but it gets boring so how do you edit your experiences into a story that people actually want to read um i um so i start by just writing out purely factually which is more or less just writing up a diary essentially and i think a lot of travel books don't really go beyond that stage and that's why they're quite boring um so i write down everything that happened and then i and then i try that's when i start to try and get some sort of structure of that I suppose the narrative flow of trying to think what's the point of my book what what's the message that I'm trying to get across mm. and then try and just be a bit ruthless at anything that doesn't really fit to that then I axe it out um, and I try and only leave in the bits that are interesting to other people not the bits that are interesting to myself and then once I've once I've done that that's then usually axed a massive amount of text um, and then I tend to which it's a bit of an old fashioned way of doing it, but I usually um, put my book down to about six point font or four point font, tiny, tiny thing, and print out the entire book, which then makes it about 30 pages or so. And I spread it all over the floor and I, I cut it all out and into, uh, into re and reorganizing it. I'm sure there's some sort of computer technology that can do that for me. It's Scrivener, it's Scrivener. Yeah, but I find it very satisfying to print out my whole book and cut it out and just put it into an order that works and that that then makes a huge difference for seeing what's repetitive because as you say a lot of it is very repetitive and I try then to some so in, in for, for me my books often have getting up in the morning taking the tent down kind of stuff but really you only need to know about that once really so uh, by re when I rearrange it all like that I find all of the times I've done it and I can just take the best bits and distill it down to one example of tent taking down or something. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And one of the questions people have about memoir is how true can you be about people who are still alive, about places that you actually visit and how about offending people? What's your take on that? Um, I thought when you started asking me that question, you were going to ask me about just the general truthfulness of Memoir things. Yeah, we'll, we'll come back to that one. Uh, um, <laughs> um, I think, generally speaking, when I write about other people, um, I just change their names um, just because it seems easier to do that. Unless I'm saying something really nice about a friend and then I'm leaving their real name. But otherwise, I just change their name, change the town, change the country if necessary. Mm. Um, just simplifies it. And that means you can be then as mean as you like then. Although um, I'm not very mean. <laughs> no, but you know, sometimes people don't, you know, there's emotional things on journeys and you have been on journeys with other people. So, um, yeah. you know, that must, you must get really pissed off with people or, you know, there must be times when you want to rant about things. So do you just not do that? Well, that's an interest. Another interesting aspect is trying to write about the, the people that you go with on the journeys. The, um, the sort of trips I do are quite physically and mentally difficult which means that with the best will in the world you end up hating the person that you're with even though they're a very good friend of yours mm. and uh, and I think if you don't write about that sort of stuff in a book then it's a bit it's an important part you're missing out uh, but so far I've never I've never fallen out with someone for after the journey itself um, and as I think so far so long as I remain friends with them afterwards I think it's fine just to put a bit of honesty down cause, and I try to be neutral I say this person was very annoying and I'm sure I was very annoying to him in return yeah um, but I think you have to um, I think you have to value the the uh, the quality of the book more than minorly offending some guy you spent a few nights in a tent with 
Yeah, no, fair enough. Um, so you did mention actual truth there, and that's another, I guess, a, something that's happening in with narrative nonfiction, which I think is, well, certainly There Are Other Rivers feels like narrative nonfiction to me, which is a more story-based approach than a necessarily truth-based approach. So um, what do you think about that? Do you, do you say your writing is narrative nonfiction, and, and where's the percentage of truth in it? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, uh, actually I think I might have put it in the forward, I can't remember, but I, the old um, Morecambe and Wise sketch of uh, saying that there's all the right notes, not necessarily in the right order, um, and everything in that India book is true, as in everything happened, uh, it didn't necessarily happen in the chronological sequence that's depicted, um, but everything actually happened and I think actually that's true with my other books which are just normal far more normal um, travel books there's a little bit of reshuffling of things and the conversations I put in although I tend to not put much dialogue in just out of because I can't be bothered which is a rubbish reason to do it um, but that is basically just made up to suit the mood of the thing so I think the essence of truth is there rather than it standing up in a court of law I think mm. No, absolutely. But, but you can, I suppose, though, really, with, with the India book, what I was hoping, um, which might be a bit grandiose, is hoping that by doing the reordering of it, you end up with a, a more truthful truth than just a pure narrative chronological account. Mm, no, absolutely. And then, and so what about your own personal growth then as a travel writer? Because I think there's quite a difference between your first book and this latest one. Um, so what do you feel about your development as a writer? Um, the first book I wrote was just, well, I'd never really done any writing um, since I was about 15 until I started to write the first book. But I, I'd read a lot of books uh, but I hadn't written much, so I just wrote a, and I tried, when I sat down to write my first book, I tried to think of a really clever way of writing it, but I couldn't think of any really clever way of writing it, so I just settled for a normal travel book of I went here, then I went here, then I went here, um, and I think as I've done that, I've, I've got better at just doing that that um, part of it. Then for this this latest book, was just a bit of a gamble, really, for, for in many ways. I, I had my four previous books were with a, a normal publishing company but for this book I chose to self-publish it, I chose to write it in a, a very different way to uh, to my other books and I just took, and I really just wrote it for myself. I think having written four books already um, I had the confidence that they, they were fine those four books so this book I was going to write the book that I wanted to do and I didn't really give a damn whether anyone else liked it, I didn't really care whether any readers liked it, I just decided to write the book that I wanted to write and to be completely honest with it. Hmm. And uh, and I did a few, I, so this, I didn't get anyone to edit it, no one read it at all, no one did anything, it was just purely down to me and there's there's some pretty obvious disadvantages doing to that, going down that route, but I just quite liked doing it all my way. Um, so it was definitely a step away from the other books I've written. Hmm. Um, I suspect that the next book I write might well just be a bit more of a normal book, but I don't really know yet. <laughs> so one of the things that writers really struggle with, and you don't seem to struggle with, is this persistence and discipline issue. Now, um, tell us a bit about that. How do you have the discipline to do the things you do and write? Um, the expeditions that I do are very, very easy, I find, compared to writing a book. Um, I find writing books to be a really excruciating process. I know every time I talk to you, you sort of seem to have written 60,000 words of another book or something, but I just I just sit at my desk getting so angry at myself and doing absolutely nothing and just wasting my time and drinking tea and then and then it, and then eventually I get so annoyed that I just write loads, but I really just find it phenomenally difficult to write. Um, once I've written the whole first draft, my terrible first draft, then after that I find it quite exciting and an enjoyable experience once it's starting to take shape. Um, the India book actually I started to write straight after I got home from the India trip and I just wrote it like a normal book and I spent six months working on it full time 
And it was so annoying because it was just rubbish. It was rubbish. And I just hated the experience. And in the end, I, I gave up. It was the first book I've ever just given up on. Um, and it, was, it, it had been such a bad experience that I actually felt delighted to give up and really liberated when I gave it up. And then I just ignored it for the best part of two years, really, before I just thought of this other way of writing it. So I think it's, a, it's certainly not an easy thing to, to do. Um, and there's really, I, I haven't found any other solution other than just to stop faffing around and sit at your desk and write. I think that's really all there is to it. I think, I know, I totally agree. It is all there is to it. And it yeah. is the hardest thing, unfortunately. But no, it's really interesting that it took you that long to sort that book out. Because it's not that long either, is it? It's, it's pretty short. Well, yeah, it's ridiculously short. I originally, I wrote about 80,000 words. Um, and... And then I managed to cut it down to, I think it's about 30,000 in the end. It's very, very short. And I really, mm. um, really just tried to make it as short as I possibly could. Um, inter this is the only book I've written that I've ever reread. Um, my other books I've never even opened again afterwards. But this one I was curious to reread it. And the, the book I, I ended up after faffing around on it, when I finally decided to get down and do it, I wrote the whole thing in about two months, but um, only at night time had all my other stuff in life to do. So I tended to be doing it mostly at two o'clock in the morning or five o'clock in the morning. So I wrote the whole thing completely sleep deprived, um, high on caffeine. Um, and when I've read it again, I think it could probably have done with a few more pages but I was in such a ruthless feeling of, I've just got to cut 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 um that it's yeah it's very short <laughs> that's for sure <laughs> um so if people you know who may not have done as many adventures as you but still want to write a memoir what would be your top tips for for writing that that kind of book is this assuming that they have something interesting to write about Hasn't everybody got a life story? A memoir <laughs> I, yes, in general. I, I suppose they do, but uh, I, I've never, I always think that I don't really have the imagination to write any fiction, so, the book, so I end up having to write about stuff that I've done. So actually, and the reason I asked you to qualify that was because I think um, a lot of people who are, want to do travel writing in particular, they often email me say, oh, I want to be a travel writer. Um, and I say, where have you travelled? And they say, oh, I haven't travelled anywhere. But if you want to do a tra I think if you want to write travel books, then you've just got to go travel and and don't travel necessarily thinking about a book. Just travel because it's the journey you want to do and a journey that means a lot to you. And um, and sure, try and do interesting stuff along the way and document it copiously. But but um, I think. For a really truthful travel book, the journey's got to be come first, and you've got to do you've got to do the journey because you want to do it, not just because you want to write a book about it. Mm. Um, I think for for other memoirs, um, we're assuming that you're right that everyone has an interesting story in them. Then the only difficult thing to do is sit down and churn out the first draft of that story, um, and then then you can start the culling process. Because I I think. Um, I was almost going to say that you should try and work out whether you have an interesting story first, but I'm not sure that I really feel that because I think people write books regardless of whether anyone else will find them interesting. So I think if it's interesting to you, that's probably a good enough reason to sit down and write it. Mm. Uh, but there's no shortcut to just writing. No, although I think, you know, I tend to be quite ruthlessly commercial on this podcast <laughs> rather than... Uh... <laughs> Shock well, you, you, why on earth are you talking to me then? <laughs> no, fair enough. We'll come back to that too. But um, <laughs> I, I do, I do think that if you know, so one good uh, memoir is um, uh, what's it called Wild by Cheryl Strayed. Have you read mm. that? Yes. Yeah. So, but it, well, that one, I think the whole point was her development. It wasn't so much the the walk; it was her development and her kind of emotional story, which um, I think you do get into in there are other rivers. It is, you know, there's a lot more emotion, and I think that's a tip for writing memoir: is you know, you have to have that personal level. You actually have to give a lot of yourself on the page, rather than just recount things that happened. Yeah, definitely, and I think the more 
honest you can be, the better. And right from, from my first book, I set out to be really honest. And it's quite, a, quite uncomfortable at times to write very honestly, but I think it's a really important thing to do. Certainly being a stiff upper lip Englishman, it's, it's a bit of an uncomfortable habit to get into. And, and then my most recent book, the India book, was really honest. And there are parts of that which I very nearly didn't include, but I just forced myself to do it for, for the good of the book. <laughs> um, so then a follow-up question is what do you think about writing for therapy versus writing for publication um, I think it's great I think um, I suppose that's similar to my answer of if you think the story is interesting to yourself or useful to yourself then just go ahead and write it and uh, and the, I think that I think that's a really important part of writing and uh, I I write books even though they, I could make a lot more money doing a lot, doing the other things with my time, but I write them essentially because I want to do them, um, which is, I suppose, partly because I want to do it and partly therapy, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but do you have reams and reams of stuff that is personal that you wouldn't put out there in public, like I do, for example? <laughs> do you? <laughs> I have diaries and diaries of years and years of all kinds of things that I would never put anywhere near the public. Yeah. Um, I do write a normal diary in life, um, which actually I carry. I always have carried in my pocket. This is a, another better thing uh, that I'm sure you can get an electronic version of. But I just write <laughs> head to tape. Uh, so yeah, I write. Di I write diaries, but um, more and more now because I do a lot of blogging. That mostly, if I have some thoughts that I would write in my diary, I usually just um, modify that to be blog appropriate and put it on my blog so my blog tends to be my more immediate thoughts um, but I don't tend to write large amounts of stuff that's not published I find the whole writing process far too difficult for that <laughs> well let's talk about blogging then because obviously you have a business to going back to the commercial stuff you are a speaker um, and you you run lots of things you do lots of things um, as well as sell your books um, we'll come back to your micro adventure which is on your top if people are watching the video <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but how does blogging fit into you know your life both as a writer but also as a, a business person so <laughs> When I, after I wrote my first book, that was when I decided to commit to trying to make a career out of adventure. Um, unfortunately, my well, my first book certainly didn't pay the wages, so I needed some other some other way of earning money. And still, even now, after doing five books, there's no way I could come even close to living from my books. But right, I wanted to have adventures, and I wanted to write books, so I had to find some other way to. Um, earn enough money to allow me to do the journeys that I loved and write the books that I loved and through that I started getting into speaking um, and in order to get people to book you for your talks they need to have heard of you so the way I started trying to make people have heard of me was through blogging um, and I started to put a real effort into blogging about my field of interest which I suppose was adventures, expeditions, motivational, um, personal motivation. I just started blogging about all that sort of stuff and my blog itself doesn't make me, well it makes negligible money directly but it accounts pretty strongly for the uh, the people who find me who then book me for talks. Mm. And I'd say the same, I mean I basically get 100% of my speaking from my blog so um, you know it look, there's a bit of a backlash against this platform thing at the moment especially amongst fiction writers and it's very different for fiction writers but I, I would agree with you that as speaker and you know author and famous person as you are <laughs> you know you, you need to have a blog. So you also make a lot of videos for your um, for your blog, and you put them on Vimeo, and you know you do all this. How is it different to tell a story with film than it is in writing? Um, I I don't really know anything about making films. I just decided a, a few years ago when normal cameras had started to develop really good video capability that this was a good opportunity for me to to learn a new skill and to. Um, try and tell stories online, short, succinct stories. So I started teaching myself mm -hmm. how to make films and all of my trips now I try and document through short little videos just to try and spread the word through different channels online. And uh, 
my videos are pretty basic in that they really are just like a bad travel book. They're just ba purely chronological, really. They start at the beginning and they say this happened, this happened, this happened, the end. And the benefit you have making a video compared to writing a book is with a video you can just put a nice bit of guitar music over the top of it and, the, and call it a day. Um, so I, to be completely honest, I really don't have much clue about telling stories in videos. Um, but I really think it's something that I want to get really good at because I think um, it gener it's something that a lot of people aren't really good at yet. So it's some a way that quite easily I can differentiate myself from from other travel writers. So it's something I'm really trying to pursue. But uh, but I, I'm definitely a fumbling amateur, which I think probably goes back to the ver your very first question of just starting something, just getting going, and then you gradually get better. If I look through YouTube now, the very first videos I ever made, they're cringeworthily bad, but I would never have got to be quite good if I hadn't done those first ones. Mm, I totally agree. And I mean, I laugh about this podcast. The very first podcast I did, I, I phoned the person, put them on speakerphone <laughs> and held an MP3 player next to the phone. <laughs> <laughs> Although we're not having much luck with our Skype today. <laughs> no, we're struggling a bit. <laughs> but, um, but no, I totally agree. I think just starting is so important and learning as you go. And I really like your films. I think they're brilliant. And I think one of the important things about video is the connection. Like people can... like. Like right now people can see our faces if they're watching the video obviously um, and that makes such a difference when it comes to people being interested in you and also you buying your book right it makes a difference yeah um, and I think that the way you do all of these podcasts is really good and I keep thinking that I should do not not interviews but I should do something of me talking to the camera about stuff but I find it all a bit cringy so I <laughs> only do it for very special people on special occasions for an enormous <laughs> fee. Well, the, it is editing as well, of course. You know, we've always got to remember editing. And I imagine actually making your films, there's so much editing. I mean, there's a lot of cutting quite quickly, isn't there? Yeah, the most recent trip I did um, in the uh, the empty quarter, we had to t we started with 27 hours of footage, which we've now axed down to 50 minutes. And the final cut will be down to 30 minutes, um, so which is pretty brutal because there's all these beautiful shots and great memories for me, which all have to go. So, yeah, there's a huge amount of cutting. And I think with video, even more than with books, that basic, the basic rule is the more you cut out, the better it gets, which is mm. quite a painful way of doing it. But I think it definitely holds true with video. Mm, yeah, that's a good point, actually. Um, okay, I want to ask you about risk. Um, because you seem to have quite a high tolerance for at least physical risk um, and a lot of people find writing a book is quite a risk and certainly with self-publishing they feel as you know they're risking potentially their reputation they're they're risking you know all kinds of things judgment you know fear of criticism this type of thing so how do you approach risk uh, in the big sense and in a in a smaller sense um, well, I think in if you're trying to have adventures, then there has to be an element of risk involved. If there's no risk involved, you're just on holiday, really. And, um, I think the, the only equation that's relevant to uh, my life is adventure equals risk plus purpose. And I think that's how I try and generate the, uh, the big journeys that I do. Um, and, and I enjoy trying, I enjoy that controlled risk element of adventuring. Um, and obviously it's quite frightening at, at times, that, but it's very, very small feeling really compared to the, the fears and risks that you just mentioned of um, looking like an idiot, of people judging you, of people criticizing you. And, uh, and I, I'm getting over that now, but it certainly used to bother me a lot. When I started writing blog posts, if someone put a, a negative comment even if it was anonymous, it would bug me for a long time. It would bug me for far longer than a nice comment would. If I got a, a bad review on Amazon, that would really, really stay with me for a long time. Um, I got my first ever bad book review last summer, and that really riled me for days and days. Whereas if I get a good book review, I think, oh, that's nice, and then forget all about it. So I think it's quite easy to be harsh on yourself. Um, mm. And I think the only the only thing to it really is to it, this is far easier said than done, but the only thing to do is to just try and acknowledge that 
all those fears are really, really stupid. And for you to worry, the sort of person who's going to criticize you and condemn you for self-publishing a book is really not the sort of person whose opinion you should really hold very highly. Um, I think there'd be very few people who've actually got off their backsides and gone and written a book and published a book who would uh, ever look to criticize um, you for doing that. So I think you have to try and not worry about the the sort of people who are going to criticise you, their their opinion probably isn't worth very much, which is definitely easier said than done. Um, I was quite, when I finished this India book, although I did it in a pretty bullish mood of, this is the book I want to write, and to hell with what anyone else thinks, um, it's still very, very nice when people do like it and it's vindicated. Um, but I took, I took that as a very big risk and I found it hard to do. Um, but I think, yeah, the only thing really is just to ignore is to try and realise that it's a bit of a silly fear, really, although a very huge one, and just go and do it. Um, the worst thing that's probably going to happen with all of these things is that you'll fail and you'll be right back where you started, which is exactly where you are right now, so you might as well give it a go, I think. Yeah. Okay, so people who are interested in adventuring, um, you know, what what is your big message to, to people who are interested in that? Well, I think, I think my big message... Um, if I have such a thing, it probably is exactly the same whether it's for um, adventure or book writing or filmmaking or whatever it is, you, playing the tambourine, whatever it is that excites you. Is just is that if you if you think you might want to go and do something, and if it and if you find it quite a daunting prospect, then um, being a daunting prospect probably means it's difficult, which probably means it's worth doing. And if it's something that excites you, then you've just got to go and give it a go. And and as I said just now, the worst thing that will probably happen is that you'll fail, look a bit of an idiot, and be right back where you started. So I think in virtually anything you want to do, you've really got not very much to lose and so much more to gain. Um, but I fully acknowledge that breaking the inertia and getting started is very difficult and uh, daunting as well. Mm. And so what is micro-adventures? Micro-adventures is, um, I suppose, is my um, demonstration of all of that that I just said, which is people people often say to me that they'd like to have massive adventures, but they don't have the time or the money or the expertise or all these other reasons, which are partly valid and fair enough, and partly just the excuses that we make in our own heads to... Um, justify our own weakness and wimpishness and I do this all the time as well um, it's so much easier to blame other things and blame other people than to acknowledge that you're just a bit of a lazy wimp um, so I came up with this idea of micro adventures which are just deliberately small um, adventures just to encourage people to take that first little step mm. to get going so I've just been trying to encourage people online to just go and have a small adventure close to home rather than thinking they don't have the time to go and cycle around the world and just go cycle for the weekend or overnight or something just to get started and I think that's that's a, a pretty good metaphor for book writing or whatever it is you want to be doing. Mm. Yeah write a short story you don't have to write a whole book. <laughs> mm. Yeah exactly. <laughs> and in fact going on a micro adventure is a great way to write a short story I think you know there's always something to write about I guess. Yeah, well, I think that's a, there's a, I think there's a link up there somehow for sure. There is, and, and what are you writing next? Well, I'm next. I want no. Currently, I've now started after months of faffing around and hating myself. I've now started writing a book um, about micro adventures, mm. um, which is I think going to be a lot more of a normal book than my. Hmm. India book. It's going to be a, a narrative about these small micro adventures I've had around my own country but I'm with quite a bit of how-to instructional stuff to help people go and have these adventures for themselves. Fantastic. And actually I'm writing this in a high-tech manner, um, not just cutting out bits of paper. I've, start, I've decided to write the whole book using Evernote, so I'll let you know how I get on with that. Okay, yeah, I think Tim Ferriss used Evernote. Oh, did he? Oh, he does everything <laughs> first and better. You got to use Scrivener. It, it's it's the thing. It is the thing to use. It changed your life really well. So, where can people find you and your books online? Um, you can find my books on Amazon, or you can get them from my website, which is alistahumphreys.com. And if you go on Micro Adventures, then um, I'd like 
to hear people sharing those stories on Twitter using the uh, hashtag microadventure as emblazoned on my new t-shirt. That's fantastic. Well, thanks ever so much for your time, Al. That was brilliant. You're welcome. Thanks for having me.